podcast episode number 86. You're joining us for another fantastic show as we round up all league gaming and stadium news for the longest running podcast this side of Google Maps. That's the Sounds of Stadia podcast. You're joining myself, Chris, alongside my lovely two co-hosts, the man of many pixels, <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Richie. Hello, everybody. <laughs> And you, above, you got the order no, there, no, no, I didn't. I'm just trying something different. Episode 86, okay, when right. it, we're coming up to 100, and I'm just mixing things up a little bit. Yeah. And the Mandalorian above him, the techie <laughs> teacher himself, Mr. Tom. Yeah, I see where you were going with that. Yeah. <laughs> I see I see why there was the slight hesitation there yeah. now. Fair play. We can't, Fair play. We can't get out on that one. <laughs> All right, well, we can just start again. <laughs> Hello, Internet, and welcome to the Sounds of Stadia. No, we won't do it all again. It's, it's too it's too, uh, too much of my Sunday. Uh, but, Tom, you have a lovely helmet there, which you got for your birthday. I think you need to show it off for our fan base Oh, out I absolutely there. do. Look yeah. Um, I am such a child at heart. Like, I think I think we can all say to a certain extent that we all are, you know. It's, it's, um, it's beautiful. It is, it is such a well-made helmet, this is, as well. Um highly recommend anybody who's interested in like star wars collectibles and stuff check out the hasbro black series because this is mm. uh it is it is quality stuff you pay a little bit more than you'd probably expect just over 100 pounds but you know it's uh it's beautiful and the detail inside as well is you know it's top notch it's not just it's not just rubbish inside it's actually fully fleshed out lights and everything <clears throat> is it so. made, made of real beskar um if Beskar is a type of plastic, then sure. <laughs> <laughs> Vacu- vacuum formed, formed Beskar. Yeah. Because it, it yes. looks like it's got a bit of weight behind it, so is it comfortable? It is. It is actually very comfortable. It's well supported inside. Um, yeah. Wonderful. Good. So for audio listeners, Tom got a Mandalorian helmet for his birthday. <laughs> and you should check out youtube.com forward slash Sounds of Stadia, where you can see it in all its shiny glory. But you're not here for that today. You're here for the Sounds of Stadia podcast. We've got a great show lined up. We're going to be talking about all of the Ubisoft earnings reports. Lots of stuff trickled out. It's a very Ubisoft-centric episode, actually. Uh, we've got some new games announced on coming to Stadia, thanks to the Community Bog bog community boggling (laughs) the community boggling who sits there on the website and shares his stories from his rock uh no we've got the community blog in fact gave us the details (laughs) of that and we've also got the exciting news that crossplay came to stadia albeit briefly on one particular title but before we delve into all that exciting news for the week we'd just like to remind you to Support the channel by clicking that like button down below. Click the bell icon and hit join if you do feel so inclined because we've got a great membership program where over 40 of you are supporting us over there from as little as 99p. You get exciting things like badges next to your name in the chat. You get exciting access to stickers, access to premium, exciting, exclusive content we've also got. There's two episodes of our first looks for different games that are exclusive to our members right now. So do click join, do join, and you'll get things like side quest early as well, up to six days earlier, Richie. We've decided it's not five days, it's six days. Yeah, it usually is six days. It goes up the same day we record the episode. You can't get much hotter off the press than that, gentlemen. But... Before we get into all that, let's look a little bit of housekeeping for the week. We've had a busy week of game streams over on Stadia because we don't just do a weekly podcast. We also play Stadia games. And some big titles dropped this past week. Uh, Myself and Richie jumped into the scary world of Resident Evil Village. Spooky. And uh, we saw we met the big lady, Tom. Went on some adventures. We met some of her daughters. In fact, we we know all the whole host of characters now, Richie. Yeah, we've met them all. I believe you meet them all fairly early in the game. (laughs) Yeah, you get kind of like a grand introduction (laughs) to them all, and then they all go their separate ways. For for Ethan Winters, one Ethan Winters in his mighty hands to uh, to go and explore and uh, find out. So join us again this week. We've covered two episodes to catch up now on the channel if you do wish to do so. But we're jumping in probably for a double bill this week again at some point, and we'll see how far we get. But uh, Lady D, Tom, Lady D, there's more to her than meets the eye. We'll say, nah, we'll say right. that much. We'll say that much. Okay. Um, but aside from Resident Evil, you two, yes, may have had uh, a couple <laughs> of. Uh, I can see your cheeky smiles though already. Uh, I, from what I understand and from what I've seen, you two opened up a <laughs> bottle of red wine each this past Friday and dived into the exciting vineyard operation of Hundred Days. Do you want to give did. us a, give us a rundown of uh, one? 
how fun you found the game, and two, how hungover <laughs> you were the next day, Tom. <laughs> yeah, that's the uh, that's the that's the question right there, isn't it? Really? Um, yeah, hundred days. I think Richie and I we could both say that we we had a great time streaming it. Yeah, um, definitely brilliant community interaction there we uh we, we had a whole host of ideas for different uh different names and labels that we should be putting on our bottles um we met some we met most of the characters of the game and then ran the vineyard into the ground <laughs> we ended up literally right on cue for us to finish we bankrupted the business <laughs> yeah it was like literally like tom as he's doing his outro he's clicking through like next 10 and it bankrupted us. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, so yeah. So where did it all where did it all fall down? Uh, well, Tom running it while drinking wine. <laughs> That's where it fell down. Yeah, yeah. I think I think very early on I made a terrible decision to buy a shop which I didn't need. Right. <laughs> um, so I invested a lot of the initial earnings that you get when you pick up the vineyard. Um, I spent a lot of it in areas where I probably shouldn't have done. I think I've got a good grasp of the game now as to how to make money fairly quickly. Um, is it not drinking we... your own produce by any chance? <laughs> no, I think that was that was that was some of the fun stuff, really. But we uh, we really slept on white wine for a while, didn't we? We never we, got around to. We were trying to get up and going because we were in debt because of the, the <laughs> shop that we could never get the funds to get the field going. Turns out you can't buy grapes if you don't have money. <laughs> yeah, I did notice at one point during the video you had like one euro to your name. Yes, we did. That was the, yep. the how fine of a line you were between going bankrupt for a long time. Yeah, that's, uh, that's how. So you I do ended it. up. Um, I ended up. I ended up drinking my sorrows away, and I can tell you for a fact that yesterday was a very difficult day for me. Very, very difficult. So, uh, I think Richie, you were doing all right, but um, yeah, I ran the <laughs> lucky you i suffered until um probably solid into the afternoon at least <laughs> wow that's uh that's some good going though um good stuff good stuff uh, favorite favorite name i did enjoy some of the names the chat were throwing out for suggestions for bottles of wine uh <laughs> res re what was it resident vintage resident vintage <laughs> um yeah. sips of yeah one, yeah, one of my favourite ones, I think, was 16 characters because it was purely the character <laughs> yeah. limits. Yeah. Um, that, we had, that one. We had, some, we had some brilliant ideas coming yeah. through. So thank you so much for everyone who tuned in with that. Mm. I, I should say that 16 characters was inspired by the wine that Tom was drinking called 19 Crimes. <laughs> 19 Crimes. Yeah, I've still got a bottle of red that I need to, uh, to crack open and uh, sample as well. But yeah, it looked like an absolute great time. One of the best moments I think I enjoyed watching it back was probably the logo creation and your decision to make an absolute, like, the shittest bottle possible for, like, value, <laughs> bargain bin, pick up for $5, five euros bottle of wine. Yeah. And the funniest thing of it all, it was exact, the exact same batch that you guys put into your premium bottle. So don't trust these two, everybody out there. If, you, if Sounds of Stadia ever have a merch store selling wine, it's the same stuff. Go for the cheapest. Yeah. Yeah, I think the cheapest stuff actually sold better, sold for more anyway. Hey, everyone it loves did, a bargain. Yeah. Everyone loves a bargain, <laughs> especially if it tastes as good as the premium stuff. Yeah. Uh, that's that's brilliant. But uh, yeah, 100 Days available now, of course, on Stadia. It came out on Friday, I believe, Friday, Thursday last week. Um, yeah, Thursday last week. How did you find, you played the whole thing in mouse and keyboard, right, Tom? Mm. How did you how did you find actually having a Stadia game that was kind of more committed to the mouse and keyboard aspect as opposed to controller? Was it nice to have? I, nice to see? Um, yeah, I think I think I'd always prefer to play simulator type games like that with a mouse and keyboard. It just feels more um, it, it feels more natural to me if I were playing a game like The Sims or if I was uh, doing a roller coaster tycoon type game, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd probably be more inclined to actually be using a mouse and keyboard just because I feel like with that isometric type of view, you've just got more control of where things go. Whereas with when you're using an analog stick, when you've got that isometric sort of angled view, you don't know whether the right's going to take you to the right, mm -hmm. up diagonally or down diagonally. So I, I just sort of feel like it's more instinctive to play it in that sort of fashion, really. Um, be interested to know what people thought of it with the controller, though, because I, I still yet to try it. I did say I was going to do on stream, but um, wine sort of took priority, <clears throat> should we say? I didn't have enough hands. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, stuff. But no, uh, I think it's great to see that's come. We've, I think, all three of us have agreed we'd love to see Stadia utilize the the mouse and keyboard accessibility a little bit more and maybe bring some kind of ports across i've been shouting out on twitter a good couple of times for frontier development i think planet coaster and jurassic world evolution those style of games which do have console variants would be the perfect get for stadia because it gives that uh it gives the options for the player whereas you wouldn't traditionally have that on a playstation or xbox because you're beholden to the controller rules 
Uh, fantastic stuff, though. So, yeah, look out for more live streams in the future. Resident Evil Village, in particular, sponsored by Resident Vintage uh, 2021. Oh. Special bottled uh, produce from our good friends Tom and Richie here. It wasn't Excellent. Stuff. Wine. You've got like 52. Really acidic. Oh, yeah. Really acidic, yeah. I've heard. Uh, but, first of all, gentlemen, that's it for housekeeping. So, let's dive into the thick, deep news stories of the week with the. Super sexy special Stadia Story segment, aka the news. The news. What what sponsored uh, news segment wine would you like to have this week? If you had to pick another bottle from your collection, uh, we'll go with the Sips of Stadia Premium this week. Sips of Sa- oh, was it Sips of Stadia P? Because you couldn't fit Premium on the label. Yeah. <laughs> Sips of Stadia P. That was right. So P it stands for Premium. Is that because it's bottled Not piss? piss water. <laughs> yeah. Piss fast. That was the from... same one. That was the same one as the cheap wine that we saw. That was the that was the original bottle. The Beautiful Stadia stuff. Premium. Beautiful stuff. Uh, you can find that now in the description. The link to our wine cellar below. Um, this week's news is actually brought to you by one of our new members, Louise, who did join us on. Uh, I think it was the Resident Evil stream, Richie. You joined us as one of our members, yeah. just like you can remember. So do click join. Check out the perks that you bet get below on the YouTube channel. Uh, we appreciate your love and support. So thank you, Louise, and everybody else who joined us as a member. First news story of the week, gentlemen. This is a very Ubisoft-centric episode. As we said, Ubisoft had one of their many, many earnings calls, being a publicly traded company, and it's great for leaks. Now, a good friend, uh, Duncan, and the team over at cloudywithachanceofgames.com, uh, were listening in on that earnings call. Not actually like listening in <laughs> that hacked that hacked Ubisoft's call. They were listening in with their earphones. Uh, they just covered the news. And uh, within that, we got quite a lot of stuff, very Stadia-centric and very, very good news for Stadia. It's, it's some things we probably anticipate and wanted for a while, but to see them actually publicly shared in an earnings call is really, really good for Stadia going forward into the future. So first up, Resident Evil. Resident Evil? Why did I say Resident Evil? Resident Evil. What? It's just it's so much in my mind at the moment. Uh, Rainbow Six Siege. Siege? Siege. 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 Uh, it's part of their title release schedule. So first quarter, April to June 2021. Uh, they've marked down a few games, but we'll break them down one by one. Uh, we've got Rainbow Six Siege. Siege. We've got For Honor, which is the biggest surprise to me. And we've got mm. uh, Uno's 50th anniversary uh, version because Uno will never die; it will just live on and get iterations time after time after time. Um, they release them with their kind of the the platform entries as well at the same time. A couple of other things in there, I think, some DLC for Watch Dogs and stuff as well. Uh, Division expansion season six, but I think the biggest thing for us is that we've had it rated by the ESRB in the past, and then nothing really ever came of it. To see it here in the earnings call is fantastic. So Rainbow Six Siege, gentlemen. Absolutely. Not that far. I feel like I'm saying siege wrong every time I say it now. <laughs> uh, finally coming, and hopefully not too long. If it's first quarter 2021, that means by the end of June, which is next month, we should point out, uh, we should have Rainbow Six. Yeah, definitely. Do- yeah. Go ahead. Ooh. I, I should definitely. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, I was going to say, I think it's actually timed quite nicely with their next big update for Rainbow Six as well. Um, sorry, for Siege, I should say, because Rainbow Six is the franchise. But uh, this is the kind of game that we've been talking about and hyping about for Stadia for quite some time. So it's nice it's to know that Ubisoft are now actually going to go and do this. Um, you know, we've been talking about things like Apex. We've been talking about things like Fortnite and so on. Uh, the reality is, you know, Siege falls very well into not so much the sort of battle royale category, but very much that sort of um, almost, you know, free to play with operators that get rotated in and out. You can purchase new operators and so on as well. Um, I think it's very much the kind of game we would love to see and are very going to be very grateful to have on the platform now. I'd say it's one of the multiplayer games that defined the last generation of consoles. The fact that it pretty much ex- existed for the entire duration of mm. the PlayStation 4 era. It falls into that I... category of um, of like competitive shooters, I suppose, in a way as well. Team-based shooters like mm. Overwatch as well, which yeah. we've, you know, I've got quite a history of enjoying that game. So getting Siege is, is again, it's going to be quite nice, particularly if we do also get cross-play as well as part of that to support... Yeah. You know, yeah. playing with people well, on other platforms. That was my follow. Siege is actually very playable offline, though. Like yes, with just look with uh, well, I think 
Chris, Chris and I and a few others that have just played Siege against Bot and it is actually still fun. Yeah, that's that's what we would probably do yeah. to start off with as part of a first look. I'd imagine they play with bots, but <clears throat> that that leads into my first question: what you alluded to there, Tom, with with this launching by the end of June, Siege we we'd imagine is is going to truly truly benefit from having crossplay. Yeah, and then that kind of also ties in with my second follow up question, with which is Ubisoft Plus rolling out globally. Mm-hmm. Um, do we think they're both going to hit at the same time? That one, arguably one of the biggest titles that's kept alive, and then also Ubisoft Plus going global. I, I think it's interesting you say that about um, Ubisoft Plus because I know there's there's sort of a deal in place with Ubisoft Plus on other platforms where if you are a, a player of Siege, you also get with an Ubisoft Plus subscription, you get access to everything within the game as part of it. So you know all of the operators, or essentially almost like the premium passes that you get within the game all come packaged as part of Ubisoft Plus, which I think is a great incentive for somebody who does play a game like Siege there, as well as, you know, might dabbling with uh, with with other games like Watch Dogs with Assassin's Creed and so on. And it would be very nice to see that we get the global release of Ubisoft Plus because we already know that you can access the US version through, you know, through a VPN at the moment, pretending that you are in the US and pay in in british currency in canadian dollars whatever it is you want to go for so it's it seems at this point really that maybe they're just trying to flesh out the legality of it in different countries and just get some deals in place rather than the actual sort of server side um aspects of it i think ubisoft plus is pretty much raring to go internationally yeah definitely it, i've not had any complaints from our friend of over the other side the atlantic and over in the states that say it, it performs poorly or anything like that so i don't think you sort of have an issue with the technology it's just a case of probably yeah getting them legal boxes checked so they can re- um, push it maybe yeah. that's why they initially planned to release it as a as a beta hmm. in the states only just okay it, we've got everything in place for the us we haven't got everything in place for other countries let's just push it if we put call it a beta then people it just buys us time well but we're... actually that's ubisoft plus is why i wasn't surprised about for honor coming yeah it's just more more to their library yeah. it actually harks really well to uh, one of the questions uh, somebody asked in our discord i think it was um Bethlehem plays games in our Discord chat, which if you're not part of, by the way, if you do listen to us every week and you think, actually, I'd like to talk more and expand on these conversations, check out our Discord. There are the links below in the description. Uh, us three are in there, along with many, many people as, as part of the Sounds of Stadia community. Uh, if you've got questions, you want to just chat a little bit more, awesome group of people, always open. I think chat happens pr- practically daily. Yeah, come say hi. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, the question was posed. Um, Ubisoft leaning so heavily into these cloud platforms I think Ubisoft know exactly what they're doing with their library of games and their catalogue and they are just essentially building the foundations to create a, an influx of cash from uh, a platform that doesn't require a middleman as such so yeah. we know with Stadia you can just have Ubisoft Plus without a Stadia Pro subscription so essentially Ubisoft have a platform here you can subscribe to play just their games just their library with nothing you don't need to buy a console which is the, the, funnily enough the argument we've been making for stadia for so long but stadia does in a way just negate that console price input and if you're a big fan of ubisoft and you love half of the games titles like for honor and such that's huge and i think ubisoft know yeah. what this roadmap looks like and i think as a business i think it's crazy how well they've been run especially with that takeover that was going to happen a few years back and they managed to fight that um that off and then now they're just the same. The one of the most consistent think, AAA developers out there that run on such a large scale, with such a variety of wealth. Uh, but then that leans into, I guess, next question, guys. Uh, For Honor, big surprise. Yeah. I thought. I know it's. <laughs> I know it has its like kind of seasons and it's supported just like Siege has been. I think it's up to year five now, uh, which is crazy. I remember playing the uh, the beta when that first launched. Big surprise for me coming to Stadia this one, and I think it will need crossplay for the type of game it is. I don't think it has the yeah. oomph uh, Rainbow Six it's comes more, with. It's more niche. It's I more think. of a niche. It's more niche, definitely. Um, but it, it's nice to see that, it, although it is more niche, it does have a thriving community behind it. The fact that it is in the what year five at this point, year six, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. So yeah, as I said, I wasn't actually that surprised that it's coming to Stadia. I may have been surprised that it's coming so soon, mm-hmm. but. I think with the commitment for Ubisoft Plus to come to Stadia, I think everything that is on the console for from Ubisoft is coming to Stadia. 
it's more a case of when rather than if. Yeah, right. Okay. We definitely know that that relationship's been there for quite a while as well. And it's nice to see them continue to build on that because, you know, clearly since the launch of Stadia, I suppose we've had so much love from Ubisoft that um, I think it's fair to say that Ubisoft, as far as developers go, have probably made the most money out of the platform so far just because of, you know, the sheer amount of games that are available, the sheer quality of the games, and also the fact that it is just continued support. And Ubisoft actually had some um, si- um, simultaneous AAA releases on Stadia, yes. where I don't yeah. think any of... I can't, maybe a Square had anything that come out day and date? Or is it just back part? No, a- we Avengers. had a CD project with Cyberpunk. we got Avengers. Capcom have recently. Yeah, um, Avengers. Yeah. Outriders from Square as well. I think we should steer clear yeah. of Outriders. Keep with the barge pole. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, in terms of support. But I think <laughs> yes. Ubisoft have Watch Dogs, Assassin's Creed, and um, Immortals. They're yeah. three huge titles. And yes. we would we would have had Far Cry at this yeah. stage, and Riders Republic, actually, if things hadn't yeah. had panned out. So it would have been huge. But this kind of all goes back to the, the conversation around Ubisoft seeing it as their own platform. We know Google said back in February they're going to leverage this with business partners. And almost sell Stadia as an option, an optional extra in a way. This is hundred percent what that looks like for Ubisoft, right? I'd imagine they yeah. supply the games; they're able to negotiate a bigger cut of that UPlay Plus, Ubisoft Plus, sorry, subscription fee. Because you'd imagine if Google are just giving them Stadia and with no Stadia Pro required, Stadia must have a return on that fee instead. So it'd be funny enough to see Stadia make more money from the Ubisoft subscription than it does its own Pro subscription. But in a way, that just benefits both parties. So I think it's in Ubisoft's best interest to make their catalogue look as rich as possible, which will mean bringing older titles. I do think we'll see all the older Assassin's Creed games at some point as well. I do honestly think we'll see games like uh, Anno, which I know a lot of the community yeah, shouted about, was, saying, give us that PC variant. Anno, actually. Why do you yeah. want to see Anno, Richie? Why do you think that would be um, good? Basically, what you've just touched on, it's, this is a game that's currently just locked on PCs because of the style of game it is. It's kind of like Civ-style game. Hmm. Um, but I think it'd be again. It's perfect for Stadia with Stadia being mouse and keyboard enabled. You can just oh yeah, I, if you're into them like management sims, there's one. I know mm-hmm. we know we've got humankind coming. Yeah, fantastic. Well, yeah. It's achievable. Yeah, very it's achievable. Exciting stuff. Did either of you two um, play For Honor? By the way, have played For Honor back in the day? No, no I've never even touched it. Which is um, you know, it it seems very much my kind of game as well. I just never never picked up on it very intriguing gameplay style the fact that um it's first person which is again not ubisoft traditional classic but you uh you have to use the controller stick to block so if someone attacks you from the left you have to swipe left on the sticks to block to the left block up above and it actually mechanically it plays very different to any other first person game like that there is traditionally obviously shooters you're very much in control of where you're aiming but this is you have to factor in a lot more things block guard attack lunge all that kind of stuff um and the fact that it just takes all these different um i'm not not, like not mythologies but uh, cultures i guess in a way of like warfare i think they introduced um japan was one of the latest ones or medieval something but essentially it's yeah japanese medieval huns and then they, they've added other other cultures in over time and anything that's just got like a history of like warring adds them in and again seasonal content's been amazing the support's been fantastic and uh i haven't played it in years so i'd be very intrigued to pick it up now and see how much it has changed but yeah there's yeah. not really anything like it out there so i'm not surprised it's found its niche audience because if you're the only one doing it right <laughs> You're the only place people go to. Yeah, uh, that's true. Final one from the earnings report. Then just to wrap up, we couldn't we couldn't leave this story without talking about uh, Uno. Fiftieth anniversary uh, right. has also been rated. We've also we've already got Uno right because we had the Phoenix Immortals Phoenix Rising DLC come yeah. as well. Uh, Tom, yeah. you've got Uno right? Yes, yes, I do. Are you, ha- are you excited about the fiftieth anniversary, or is Uno kind of like a one time purchase for you? I think it's just it's just I. I just see it as being yet another pack added into the game where it's just going to be a skin and the likes rather than a, a, a standalone game. It could very well be a standalone game. I I, I don't know. Um, but again, it's just another deck of cards, isn't it, really? Yeah, yeah what can you really change about Uno? The game's kind of defined. I imagine very, they might make strongly. it. This is yeah. what Uno is. Then the game, the game, uh, video game version is just like, how do we put this card game into a video game? I don't think mm. there's a lot you can do with it, really. Yeah. 
And this kind yeah. of backs up that Ubisoft catalog. Would they bother bringing another version of Uno over if it wasn't for having the full catalog requirement there? I'd imagine this is an easy part, a card game. It's not exactly pushing the graphical boundary of video games that that far. So this strikes me as another one. It's, it's just a tick box in the catalog to say, look, we've got it. It's on Ubisoft Plus. If you subscribe, here's another type of game you could play with your family. I think we've got Monopoly, of course, as well. So... It's just yeah. again, it's it's every single title I think will eventually trickle over. Interesting. Yeah. Which may mean we might get Prince of Persia once upon a time. We can all, we can all hope. We can all hope because it has been I delayed. Think, I think the last version of Uno was dates back to like twenty sixteen. Mm-hmm. So if the fiftieth anniversary edition is a new get a new standalone, maybe yeah, maybe they just decided it's, it's time for a refresh of the IP. It's like refresh of the IP, bring a new version. <laughs> Gonna <out>. reboot it. <laughs> New characters. Well, reboot Scrabble. Let's go. <laughs> it might even be a licensing thing. Like yeah. they might have to produce a game every five years for the sake yeah. of maintaining the license. Well, is it? Yeah, keep the trademark. Is it Hasbro, yeah. Mattel? Someone will own it from the board it's game it, side yeah. of things. Yeah. So it, it might be a deal similar to that. So interesting stuff. Exciting things for all the new games. Uh, some other news did come out of it that wasn't kind of like game rollout necessarily. Uh, the next story on our dock this week, story number two, is uh, Skull and Bones, the much-awaited video game that was revealed back in 2017, now, gentlemen, <laughs> uh, has been delayed. Yep. No surprise. Washed away with the tide. Washed away, indeed. Uh, it's been pushed back now to the financial year 2022 to 2023, so they've put it back in for quite, put it back in the oven for a little bit longer now. Um, again no confirm announcement for Stadia but again the fact that it's Ubisoft and it's so far out you would imagine unless something drastically went wrong this again would probably come day and day to Stadia I would imagine you've got to imagine another year of this relationship it's getting bigger and better and Ubisoft if if they've brought all the bigger AAA titles that have came out like Richie said last year into this year yeah this seems like a shoe in so we'll keep covering we'll keep reporting this Uh, not that we really know much more about it yeah I'd I'd love to I, I want to see like a no clip documentary on Skull and Bones when it comes out and go because I mean we're talking literally the earliest this game will come out is about a year from now. Yeah, and <laughs> even then, because um, yeah. we've we've theorised before, it's essentially they took the idea of Black Flag because Black Flag did so well. The problem with Black Flag now is it came out that long ago. I feel like people are starting to forget or not care any longer about the pirate uh, style game, and then they announced it was online multiplayer. And I think that got a bit of a backlash where people were thinking, I kind of just wanted a, a single place pirate game, yeah. like similar to Black Flag. And then they said, I think when the first, or the first or the second delay, they said the scope had got so big, they wanted to work on it a little bit longer. And now they've just came out and said, yeah, we're going to batten down the hatches and push it back <laughs> again. <laughs> yeah. They've realised it's not just as simple as, re- like, as, as calling your main character Kenwood Edway. <laughs> you can't just tweak it a little bit you can't um, just tweak it you've got to change some things as it, well it might be it might be a strategic decision maybe they've pushed pushed it back to the point where if it was aimed at last generation console it's like that's not going to work anymore we need to go for the next generation so it mm-hmm. might be just let's put another year in the, in the oven and just do a PS5 Xbox Series X Stadia, yeah. um, Luke, uh, Could PC be. release yeah. and forget interesting that. Uh, yeah it's a weird one i kind of my again my hype for a pirate game is very very high because i again black flag was awesome who doesn't like pirates realistically it could do some interesting things the online ever persistent world similar to sea of thieves kind of does have me a bit wary about it on that on that yeah. front i don't know if that's really my bag we've spoke before i think us three yeah. gamers we don't have the time in our lives for ever persistent worlds to live in unfortunately as much as yeah. we'd love to um so cards on the table or hands on deck, gentlemen. Which comes first, Black Flag to Stadia or Skull and Bones? Oh, Black Flag. Either. Black Flag, definitely. Just to yeah. Black Fla- I, I'm, I'd expect Black Flag this year, to be honest. Yeah. Like, okay. It's not that much of a stretch, really, considering we got um, Syndicate and Unity last year. That is true. And we had that that little image Tease. leak from the search bar, so you Tease. know. Yeah true very true um so moving on from skull and bones then story number three from the ubisoft rollout is uh they've kind of they've received a little bit of a backlash this past week or so regarding their 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 future plans for video games so they did come out and say that they were making a a switch towards free to play games Mm. which i think i guess skull and bones may fall into that bracket now when it does finally arrive on on our shores 
maybe this is why Skull and Bones being pushed back. Maybe this is mm. going to be the new one of the new flagships rather than just um, a game. Another ship reference. Exactly, yeah. As many we can get in. So, speaking to investors, Ubisoft financial boss Frederick uh, Duger uh, said the company's focus on releasing three to four big budget games per year was no longer a proper indication of their value creation dynamics. Or in yeah. la- or in layman's terms, Ubisoft wants its profits to grow by making money from different things. Uh, yeah. And it's obviously looked to the likes of Activision and what they've done with Warzone. They're still able to get out an annualized Call of Duty game, but then yeah. on the other side of the coin, make millions from an ever-present version of that game. I think what they're trying to do, the way I read into this is they're trying to they're trying to maximize the potential of Ubisoft Plus. Mm-hmm. I think that's what they're going to go for. They're going to go for those those sort of arrangements like I mentioned before with Siege with sort of like, you know, giving everybody access to everything and start implementing that into into future titles as well. So let's say with Riders Republic with Ubisoft mm-hmm. Plus you might get access to all the different range of vehicles or characters and so on customization options with skull and bones you might get all these customization options for your ships and stuff like that too i just think that's what they want to do they want to try to maximize that monthly fee where people are constantly paying money rather than buying one-off titles yeah that, that's the thing with one-off titles you have a massive spike in your income for around that month, a month or two after it comes out mm-hmm. and then it'll plateau yeah um yeah. which is and must that must be horrendous for accountants to deal with <laughs> where if they, if you can you're still going to have them spikes but with the more free play model that income is more stabilized at a higher level that base level is increased yeah it's kind so of the way the market's just evolved over the last like the entire yeah. last generation with the rise of free to play it's almost like companies you have that that the, the mobile industry did that race to the bottom having a mobile game that was like four or five pound wasn't good enough it had to be 90 under that 99p 99 cents banner or free and then you made it back on microtransactions and some would say it totally killed the mobile industry (laughs) yeah in in hindsight i think it's a shame for the mobile industry because they were bringing out uh, games that were five six pounds but the quality was terrible on on Mm. them in Mm. the early days so then people go it's not worth the money so then they bring it so they found in the microtransaction model bringing out these crap games for free yeah but then now there is good games out there in in the mobile space which are now bundled in with all the crap. Yeah, it's it's an interesting dynamic, but I think for Ubisoft, yeah. what what you said there, Tom, I think the the getting the most value out of their IP, and yeah. Ubisoft have some stellar IP under their umbrella, so it may, it makes sense as a business they would look towards that. The more we talk about this, I'm just getting the vibe that Ubisoft are do <clears throat> are essentially creating their own Game Pass. Yeah, yeah, that, that, and, that's that's exactly what mm-hmm. Ubisoft Plus feels like to me. And you're totally right. With all the DLC being included, that's such good value. Why would you drop? Like I, and I think you as well, Richie. I've had a bit of a dilemma deciding on buying PlayStation games for the first time in my life, uh, like as an adult, because that seventy pound mark, I am now starting to think, is that worth my money right now, or could I be patient and pick it up in a few months' time for half price or even cheaper, arguably? Because that's a big jump up for just like every other month. If I want to play two games this month. That's like £140 just to play two games, whereas alternatively, a £10 subscription could net me the same return of like hours of games played, arguably. So well, that's, the balance that's is tipping. I'm it as well. It's like, I don't think I'll be buying a Ubisoft game anytime soon because I'm going to wait for Ubisoft Plus. In fact, I have a PlayStation. If I, want, if I really wanted to play a Ubisoft game and it was on Ubisoft Plus, I could do through that anyway, even mm-hmm. though it's not on Stadia yet. So it's like, well, why would I fork out 60 quid? Hmm. for a game when i can play the the game for a tenner yeah yeah and that's again if we if we talk about cutting out the middleman ubisoft he's all of our games he's all the season content he's all the dlc how much is ubisoft plus guys is it like 12 pound 99 in the uk uh Uh, that's probably probably translates around the 10 to 12 mark yeah so that much or how much is the the like Valhalla Gold Premium Deluxe Super Get Everything Edition? It's like a hundred pound, right? Yeah, yeah, probably reduced now, but so like that seventy five plus. <laughs> that's like just over a tenner or hundred pounds to play. Like that's yeah. the value again. Like I again, as such a lover of like physical media and owning it, even though I'm a big Stadia fan, ironically, I think yeah. that the tides are changing. Without throwing another Skull and Bones reference well, in there, tides are that, turning. That's the thing. Going all the way back to the origins of the podcast, that was the thing for me. Is like I've typ- typically bought physical media for platforms because it's cheaper. That's my that was always my main reason. Like if I can get it, if I can get a disc like three months after for like mm-hmm. twenty quid less, I'll buy the disc. 
because it's just being a smart consumer. Mm -hmm. But with things like moving more to digital platforms and cloud streaming, it's like, when I was investing in Stadia, like, I kind of just put that aside, like, yeah, this is going to change whether I like it or not. Yeah. I might as well accept that change and just embrace it. Yeah. And things like Ubisoft Plus, I do think are the way forward. That is the way the industry is going. It's and it's mm. yeah. I think I honestly think it is, and we've seen it. We've we said since like episode one that yeah. the music industry fell to this, the television industry mm -hmm. fell to this. Lockdowns forced the movie industry to change this. Mm -hmm. Like, look at how many big movie titles have now released on like HBO Max and stuff, and Disney Plus yeah. with like premium access day one of release. I think video games with with the rise of Game Pass and then all the stories we've got now around this. I think it will be a matter of time before we'll just have a subscription. And Stadia gives us that benefit tenfold because it's no downloads, no updates, well, no waiting. It's just click, play, boom, you're in for your 12 quid. Yeah. For the first time ever, the two major flagship consoles, the PlayStation and the Xbox, have brought up two SKUs immediately. Both of them have a disc-free version. Mm -hmm. That is another good point as well. So, uh, Ubisoft... PC gaming's been there for a long time anyway, so it's like... Times are changing. And uh, Ubisoft did come on and clarify, so they didn't get too much of a backlash. They did clarify saying, our attention is to deliver a diverse lineup of games that players will love across all platforms. Uh, we're excited to be investing more in free-to-play experiences. However, we want to clarify that this does not mean a reducing our AAA offering. Our aim is to continue delivering premium experiences such as Far Cry 6, Rainbow Six Quarantine. Still calling it Quarantine, even though we thought they may have changed that name. We'll see. Uh, Riders Republic and Skull of Bones, to name a few, while expanding on our free-to-play portfolio. Um, again, I can't see Far Cry entries going anywhere. I can't see Assassin's Creed entries going anywhere. They're too popular. Uh, exactly. So, I'm again, I never really read much into this, but I know they did get a bit of a backlash. Out of, so much so they've had to come out and clarify they're not changing everything. But You mentioning Assassin's Creed. Assassin's Creed, at one point, was the poster child for video games being annualised when they shouldn't have been annualised. And through things like Unity and, um, especially Unity and Syndicate got quite a bit of backlash because they came out as kind of broken in certain platforms. Mm -hmm. So having a more free to get player games that are going and Ubisoft plus these sort of financial models that keep their finances ticking over can mean that actually the developers can take more time over their AAA games because they're not as reliant on their income. Yeah. So they got they got more time to work in it. So we might this actually may lead us. You might get less big AAA games from Ubisoft, but they might be to a higher quality. So yeah. things like you look at Valhalla, great games, and the character models a bit shoddy that stuff might disappear. Very true. Uh, a good reflection of that, actually, Richie, good point, is uh, EA. EA act actively said that the EA original games, like the recent yeah. It Takes Two from um, uh, Joseph Fares, he they came out and said that because of the money that we get from FIFA's Ultimate Team and the FUT cards um, and Apex Legends and that kind of stuff, all the cosmetics DLC, because of that constant influx of cash, that affords us to look at making more creative, smaller projects yeah. like... It takes two and these indie partnerships that they do. So, yeah, a constant yeah, flow well, from these titles could benefit. Yeah, if you think of like EA Play, if like It Takes Two, that game might not be very profitable on its own, but it adds value when it's bundled in to the rest of their offering. Exactly. Absolutely. So you're totally right. Wonderful stuff. Uh, final story then from the Ubisoft front. Uh, they have came out and officially also announced that Ubisoft Originals, which we'd get, we get, uh, we we did clock. Last week, as part of a Division Heartland announcement, it was on their like a little Netflix sig signal underneath a Ubisoft original, which I think led some speculation to thinking like, is this a TV spin-off? What is this? <laughs> um, but they've just came out and clarified that any game that's going to be Ubisoft uh, kind of exclusive in-house is now going to be listed as a Ubisoft original title, similar to how Netflix and Amazon and stuff make their content. This gentleman makes me think we're talking about libraries and you just mentioned there, Richie, having like smaller interstitial yeah. content. I can see Ubisoft reaching out and maybe doing some second party publishing deals now and yeah. they'll, they'll license their own stuff as original and then the other smaller content maybe with other studios as whatever that title ends up being. I think this just ties in strongly to what everything we've just been saying. I think this is Ubisoft pushing the Ubisoft brand a yeah. bit harder than just like the Assassin's Creed brand or the Skull and Bones brand or the Rainbow Six, the Tom Clancy brand. Mm -hmm. They're pushing the Ubisoft brand so people are aware that these games are Ubisoft games. So that's 
because you you might be you might be playing Rainbow Six Siege and not really naughty Ubisoft title if you just quit clicking mm-hmm. through the uh, yeah. opening credits. Oh, yeah. Particularly if you're a more casual that, player. Pe- yeah, it's just getting that drilled into people's minds. So like, t- basically, Ubisoft becomes synonymous with quality. And, and then, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I, I guess that does come from like a you know a financial earnings and and sort of report to stakeholders. Really, is they want to try to see the value of the brand, not the IP that is associated with the brand, but yeah. the brand overall, because that's what people have invested in. So at the end of the day, you're absolutely right. It's 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 like pushing that. It's um it's like you say, Chris, too, with the Ubisoft original label. You see it on a Netflix original and so on. There, it's it we're start, starting to move away from um these are my things and it's more like like these this is what i've created this is our stuff you know that if you buy something from ubisoft a ubisoft original yeah. this is what you can expect to get as part of that and i think again everything we can start to see it's, it's actually this um this whole financial earnings is actually very sort of um enlightening in a way it's, it's given us a good glimpse of what ubisoft are actually looking for here i think and, and what we're really starting to see is everything starting to come together. I, I see Ubisoft now as not being synonymous with any particular platform, but they just want to stand independent of everything and provide their own way forwards. Like you say, it's almost like having a service like Netflix or a service like Stadia, but Ubisoft want to have their own service. It's just available on a multitude of different platforms. Yeah, I think Ubisoft has been like that for a little while. Like, mm. that's, I think that's why we got so much on Stadia is like, they just went, look, we're going to make the games and we're just going to put them everywhere. We don't yep. care where you play them. We don't care where you buy them. We're just, there you go. Big definitely. stuff. Yeah. yeah. I think uh, Ubisoft making some clever moves right now and they're definitely fu- they future proofing themselves. Yeah. And I think we can see, we've seen EA kind of do it with partnering with Game Pass and yeah. the EA Play subscription. And I think. Again, you'd like to think, fingers crossed, EA are looking at Stadia as an option, saying, look, we don't need to be beholden to these £500 consoles and this console cycle. If FIFA and all of our games do so well, why not just put them in the cloud and have them ever-present on devices everybody already owns? Because the next FIFA iteration, they're going to be waiting on people buying the next consoles to buy it on PS5. And that's why they still make last-gen versions, because they don't want to leave that market behind. Cloud gaming allows them to not require that because it's always ever present, regardless of the tech that the consumers are running it on. So, he, he's he's a stuff. little secret about EA Play and Ubisoft Plus. You buy a game or get access to a game through that service, that money's going to EA and Ubisoft. That's not going to Sony. Sony not getting the cut as much of a cut there. They're not getting their thirty percent of the sale. Mm. So yeah, it's actually assuming, epic an Apple not. deal. There'll be <laughs> there'll awesome. be probably a bespoke deal to have that service on the platform. Yes, but yeah, they're not. If you buy Assassin's Creed that from like EA Play, you know, from Ubisoft um, directly, that money's going to Ubisoft. Mm. So interesting things, but mm. uh, it's all good news for us as Stadia players, I think, because it does yeah. just it just puts them in a better position, and it does make you think a little bit more to back in February when. They were breaking down the decisions to close their internal studios, which, again, we're probably going to touch on a little bit because of the shitty journalists out there. But the money is definitely probably better spent maybe investing in business partners right now yeah, as a so. platform rather than focusing and, on your own stuff. And when they got a big, when Stadia got a bigger user base and they start getting some more money in the bank, they could, re, they could reopen the studios. Just because they're closing now doesn't mean that's cutting the cost forever. Very true. Uh, so then, speaking of, moving on to next story, away from Ubisoft a little bit, uh, Nate Ahern, who works at uh, um, Stadia, sorry, uh, he's came out and just, I think it's been a while since we've heard anything from anyone actually at Stadia, other than the blogs and the, the, the news that happened, unfortunately, back in February and all of the, the websites picking up on little threadbare stories. Uh, he's came out and just clarified that Stadia is alive and well. And uh, he gave an interview to gamesindustry.biz. You can head over there and find out the article. Uh, Just clarified that, yeah, it's alive and well. Uh, Quote, we're well on our way to over 100 new games launching on Stadia in 2021. We're continuing to make Stadia a great place to play games on devices you already own. I tell any non-believers to take notice of how we're continuing to put our words into action as we grow the Stadia Makers program and partner with AAA studios like Capcom, EA, Square Enix, Ubisoft and others. We're pressing for more, oh, when pressed for more information, uh, he said again, focus on delivering value for our partners on, and on behalf of our players. 
he went on a little bit more talk about the pro subscription resident evil jedi fallen order landing and stuff um and again it wasn't a, a deep in-depth interview they did try and push him a little bit more to talk about the departures that recently happened which again it's a it's a non-starter i'd imagine he's not there to talk about that it's just bringing up old stories but the kind of the bit i wanted to touch on gentlemen within this is it's great to see nate out there talking about stadia with the departure of john justice i for one feel like stadia needs that front man front woman that person to come out and actively speak on behalf of the brand because we just don't see it that we get the community blog post and we know grace and chris do their work out there but Phil Harrison's been quiet. I think what a couple of weeks ago he said he hasn't tweeted since like March, and even that was just a retweet. That it needs a, a human face for the brand, like Phil Spencer is for Xbox. I think it needs something like that, and um, Nate could be that person. But obviously, him coming out and saying alive and well, we should probably touch on that. Then led to all of the amazing journalists out there in the world jumping onto yeah. the story of again re bringing up news from February now, almost four months ago, to rehash it. And I think the one probably we want to focus on was the Kotaku article, right, gentlemen? Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's my th- my thought in a nutshell, right there. It's just <sighs> yeah. Come so on. we don't we don't really talk about these stories that much because they're not news, but. Again, I, I think I just it's getting that bubbling point where I wanted to personally talk about how shit some of the journalists out, are out there. They literally take anything and twist it. And I know um, people in the state of community, they get um, rightly so defensive about it and they try and correct people. It's not really worth your time on the internet personally, I think, to get into that kind of thing because it just ends up going in the black hole void that is Twitter or Facebook or the internet. But uh, yeah, Kotaku's article... Uh, I'd say go read it, but it's not really much of a read. There's there's very little journalistic research done whatsoever. Yeah. But just wanted to start with the, the headline, gentlemen. Google Stadia, uh, sorry, Google says everything at Stadia is fine as the water reaches their noses. And then the article yeah. basically briefly mentions Nate's interview with GamesIndustry.biz, uh, but then likes to bring up the shutting down of studios, people leaving the company. Um, again, it, it quotes things like Cyberpunk and Resident Evil as, as titles, but then it doesn't really say that that's good for Stadia. It uses that as an opportunity to bring up that Stadia. Uh, Google paid millions of dollars to bring the games to their platform, which we know last week we covered Epic paying tens of millions of dollars to bring games to their platform, but it's a problem for Stadia because apparently it's a sinking ship. And he references the Google graveyard again, and it just I don't know about you guys, but I'm just you getting tired of these journalists doing lazy-ass work. For me, yeah. this reads as they've caught the headline, then wrote the story to meet the headline, rather than doing the investigation, getting the information, and writing an article about the information they found. It, it, I think for me, it's journalism done such in like a lazy in a lazy fashion, done backwards. They've not there's there, there's there's nothing new in this article. It's it's an opinion. It's all all it is is an opinion piece, and they're just taking a couple of stories and smashing them together that they're not mm-hmm. they're not fixed and. We've talked mm. to death about Stadia games and entertainment closures and how actually we don't think it's like the end of Stadia and we think it's probably a smarter decision that they're putting their money into other things to get mm-hmm. them to grow the platform rather than spending all their money developing a game which may fail. Yeah. Yeah. I think um but. when 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 we look at these articles, most of these articles are written by you know any 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 joe or sally who wants to be a journalist basically yeah. you know any anybody can sit there and write a trash piece about anything really and for some reason it gets published these days i mean if you look at the kotaku article right now the person who writes it their title is uh what that they're a they're they're a weekend writer over at at kotaku so yeah. i mean what is it what is a weekend writer it's it's like it's, the, the old mace windu quote isn't it really if like we grant you the title of writer but you do not sit on the council <laughs> oh, yeah <my> God. <laughs> yeah the um, but, yeah kataka weekend ridiculous. editor is his official title so weekend but, is good yeah, as part-time but, traffic lights okay. in my opinion what day I job the thing <laughs> i don't get is it, it's clear this is just a clickbaity article to satisfy people yeah. who just revel in stadia, hating stadia for but I don't get that if you're not interested in the platform. I, I, I just, I'll never, I don't think I'll ever fully get my head around it. It's like, if you're not interested in the platform, I would just then be apathetic towards it mm. because I don't care about it. So yeah. I, I don't know who this sort of article is servicing, but apparently there's plenty of people on the internet who must love these sort of articles because they keep pub- yeah. publishing them. 
Yeah. So they, mm-hmm. they're making money. Well, mi- mean, yeah. Misery loves company, right? So yeah. Yeah. evidently all these journalists jump on it because they can't it's be just, asked to do any research or test it out it's themselves. It's a shame to see like an, an institution like Kotaku, who I used to actually really like mm. read a lot of and respect, that just mm. seemed to have went downhill yeah. a lot. It's so... Course, like, I'm even talking for Stadia, so it's not this is yeah, yeah. a Stadia thing. This is not being, me being a Stadia fanboy at the moment. It's just like... Yeah, there's, there's I, loads I, of I, stuff. I despise bad journalism, I really do, because journalism is so important. Yeah. yeah, it really is, especially in a, in a free world with free speech. But uh, just yeah. yeah, breaking down a couple more bullet points before we move on from this uh, sour story. But during, during the interview, uh, he, he, he says that the company don't disclose numbers. Guess what? Neither did Microsoft. Never told us how many Xboxes they sold last generation at all to compete with against the PS4. Yeah. We just knew they were in last place behind the Switch and PS4. <clears throat> Moving on, he talks about, like I said, the big games, Cyberpunk and Assassin's Creed. Doesn't bring up the story about how fucking good Cyberpunk was on Stadia compared to other consoles. Still can't buy it on PS4, by the way, guys, digitally. Not a thing, like four or five months later. Yeah, but that, that, that's, that's, that's a, too that's positive. A loss for CD Projekt Red, not a win for Stadia, though. Still. Okay. Not mentioning here. Uh, mentions the Epic Apple lawsuit I mentioned with the prices they paid. Uh, and then finally, uh, mentioned within the article again, uh, at the Epic versus Apple court trial, lawyers and witnesses seem unable to clearly answer the question whether Google Stadia was still operating or not. Guess what? Because it's a jury of random members of the public. They also had to get Tim Sweeney to point out what a PlayStation was. This is a guy who made his millions selling games on the platform. They brought one out and made him point at it to clarify. So and again... This is a court case between Epic and Apple. Nothing not to Stadia, do, yeah, nothing not to do Stadia with it. Experts. And then he, he wraps up his uh, part-time weekend editorial by saying, while Google Stadia c- claims it's alive and well, I'd start digging out a spot in the large and growing Google Google graveyard because I don't think it's long for this world. But hey, as it sinks beneath the waves, at least not that many people will drown. His career will. Well... Once, it, once the door needs someone to take the flak for Stadia hit pieces, he... <laughs> I just think if yeah I, I don't know I just Definitely I'd like to trip into your own grave I'd like yeah. to think journalists just had a bit more integrity when they come to writing their pieces and evidently it's uh, it's not alive and well at Kutaku right now we could spend hours talking about it but I think in sometimes institutions start off with the best best uh, ideas and management changes things change behind the scenes the controlling parties take take over and then the, it all becomes all about the money and if a, something sells then yeah. Unfortunately, I think integrity can go off the Click, window. clickety, click bait. Um, but I, anyway, I actually feel sorry for young journalists trying to get a foothold because sometimes they end up writing stories that the main. We're being harsh on this guy. He might not even agree with this article. This might literally just be something he has to do to put food on his t- table. Well, again, if he's a weekend well, editor, you'd like to think he's got another job during the week. That maybe hopefully a editor because he's trying to get a staff job. We- you don't know so it's... we'll see but either way yeah. we'll move on from that one uh, go check it out if you want to his name's in the article <laughs> do what you need to <laughs> stay in your community but let's move Good on news. to some exciting news that happened this week uh, back to the games Destiny 2 uh, had crossplay accident accidentally switched on <laughs> by Bungie this weekend uh, we saw it circulating in the Twitter sphere that gamers were suddenly able to play with Xbox PlayStation PC counterparts and I saw a couple of cr- screenshots of people saying they were in the game. I saw people on Xbox and stuff saying that they were playing with Stadia players because you could see the little hashtag, the numbers next to their name. Total accident, guys. It was uh, Bungie came out and said <laughs> they said it was an unintended sneak peek at uh, crossplay, and it's still officially on the way and it's in development, but it will be disabled again in the coming days. Obviously, our friends over at Stadia South picked up on this. And a couple of a couple of people uh, got out there and enjoyed what little time they seemed to have playing crossplay. But this goes back to our Ubisoft conversation, I guess. And uh, Destiny Two, obviously free to play on Stadia right now, but crossplay is huge for a new yes. platform like Stadia and Amazon Luna and and anyone else who's trying to build that online player base. This just helps tenfold, and it's great to see that Destiny Two evidently would seem not too far away. I just think yeah. like once crossplay is fully enabled, like you get to a situation where let's just say you are a traveling person for business and you know all of your friends play on Xbox or they play on PlayStation. You want to jump in for a quick game of Destiny. That's where like Stadia once again becomes so useful because you, you want you don't want to take your Xbox or your PlayStation away with you. You could just it, take a Chromecast unshackled. or your phone. It unshackles the potential of Stadia at the moment. One of the biggest drawbacks of Stadia is, unfortunately, the on the multiplayer player base. Yeah, crossplay resolves that issue instantly. Yep. 
Um, but what I think what they've done here is I think they've accident because it's rumours that actually a data mine is um, found out the crossplay beta is on its way. So I think whoever's been like working behind the scenes to set that up, they accidentally hit the switch to go turn it on, and they probably went in terms like oh my god, this went left. Like and someone's like, hang on a second, let's just let them have it for a couple of days, and we can do this as a pre beta test. We can just put out like oh no, we sc- we messed up. It wasn't meant to go live. Hmm. But you can have it for a couple of days, and if it's buggy and stuff, no one's gonna like care too much because it's not meant to be out yet. <laughs> yeah. So we're well, dealing with it. Some very useful data. They get they can get very useful data out of this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. And see if if no one picked up on it, how long it could have just went on for? Yeah. Surprise! It's actually been there for seven months I, now, and no one's noticed it. <laughs> I think a game like Destiny Two is going to be pretty obvious. Oh right? yeah. That game is like mm-hmm. within minutes. Probably journalists are writing the article. <laughs> Yeah, Zach might have to do some work during the week. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, we should point out as well the kind of the marketing lens in which crossplay brings, because it, like you said, Tom, it, it opens the platform up to people who would be maybe more casual players, or they commit to one particular game, but it gives them an outlet to play it elsewhere. If you're a hardcore Destiny player, like we have a few friends with you, who've put over three thousand, four thousand hours a year into these titles. The fact that you can then play that on your lunch break or when your living room TV isn't accessible, but with your same Crossplay game files, that's huge. And uh, our, our friend who played it actually tweeted, tweeted me, texted me over the weekend and said, Crossplay is available apparently for between Stadia Thingy. And that's someone who isn't in the Stadia ecosystem. So if that's one individual plays Destiny, take that and apply it to all the Ubisoft titles, all the other games. And it just creates that understanding that I can play my save file in other places. And that's free marketing as far as Stadia is concerned. Uh- um, for me, this goes back to what we've said in the past about um, some some gamers who the, a single game is the hobby. Where I think cloud gaming is perfect for these single game hobby hobbyists. Where if you're if the only game you're interested in playing is Destiny Two, do you want to fork out for, um, five hundred quid every, every maybe five six years for a new console when you could just not mm-hmm. <laughs> like literally that's it. You just just don't. You know, buy a controller. Every you time just you not controller dies. <laughs> yeah. Ain't done steady to give another premiere edition away once a year, so if your controller's on its way out, you're probably due a free one at some point in the next few months. <laughs> oh, so um, I haven't played a Resident Evil game in a while. Yep, that was my there's premiere one. edition. And another Chromecast for, my, yeah. for a different TV in my house. A what? free premiere edition with Ubisoft 50th anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> you go. While, while we're on that, what are your plans for your premiere editions? Um, my controller is in use. Uh, as I said before, I'm keeping my founders in my, my office and getting my two um, white ones downstairs. Mm-hmm. But the Chromecast is just in the box. Tom? I might upgrade a phone or something at some point. I've got one for... So I gave gave one away to a family friend who helped us out with um, some insurance deals lately, which was pretty good because we needed home insurance. Mm -hmm. Um, And he was really grateful for that. Um, The other one, I am thinking I may either do one of two things. I may give it away as a prize at school um, to one of the students Mm because, let's be honest, they probably just want to trash talk it based on all of the articles that are out there anyway um <laughs> maybe maybe that might put out a good word out in there um alternatively i was thinking of possibly keeping it for for later on in depending on what happens in the future with stadia and with future iterations of chromecast and controllers keeping it for my son as well so we'll see what happens wonderful wonderful Mine's not even opened yet. I'm finally no. seeing it's just in case my current controllers die a death maybe in the future that I'll just have a backup that I don't need to buy when the time comes. So yeah. we shall see. I know PlayStation 5 announced two new controllers. Finally a black one and a crimson red this week and I'm telling myself I don't need it but I kind of want it. The red but looks it's, pretty mm, slick yeah, to be honest. I kind of like the black like, one as well like still. It. Really? I don't I like don't, the black one. I don't one. like the red one. But maybe more colours in the future as these premiere editions <laughs> do wind down. Uh, we should probably mention talking about crossplay as well. Uh, Dead 5 announced this week. Of course, Codemasters, now recently acquired by EA. Uh, they did come out and clarify that cross platform matchmaking is coming to Dead 5. So, again, another title getting kind of post launch support that benefits Stadia by bringing that crossplay along to it. I think in the next five or so years, crossplay is probably just going to be the norm, right, for any online multiplayer yeah. game. Yeah, um, I think it's one of them gamers we want it. Yeah. Yep. Because what we want to do is be able to play with our friends regardless of what platform we're on. Mm-hmm. I yep. think game developers want it as well because then you're not fracturing your user base. 
Yeah, it's less cold. Especially as more platforms come in the market, that means you're fracturing it even into even more sections. Yeah. Like, it's only the only people who don't want it is probably um, PlayStation because they have such a command of the gaming yeah. industry at well, the moment. Well, that was the interesting thing in the Epic story. I think it was Gio Corsi who works at, who used to work at PlayStation. Thing. I don't think he's there anymore. He was quoted as saying back in the day when uh, uh, Epic and Fortnite were having that whole cross-play initiative thing and PlayStation like held out firm as long as they could saying we don't need this uh, I think he was quoted as saying in one of the emails nobody at PlayStation <laughs> can explain how this benefits us like being PlayStation their brand yeah. and he's totally right is the, is the yeah. market leader is the front runner it does nothing but pull your player base potentially away from PlayStation if you can play yeah. on mobile Xbox where, Switch wherever else so it makes sense but I think the key, like the long game, well, you have does, to embrace it. Otherwise, it yeah, gets too the way bitter. It does impact PlayStation is it's re- it could be damaging the reputation to yeah. hold out for too long. As like oh, every, everyone else in the gaming industry is all playing nice together, and then Sony's off to the side. Yeah, that really. could have long term implications, really which is probably clip. why they eventually caved and started yeah. allowing it. Does more mark yeah. brand damage than it does actually like it would cost more in the long run to get that positive yeah. marketing back than it would uh, to just undermine it because it only takes one Absolutely. thing right to totally pull the rug yeah. out from under well if you look at just look at just microsoft microsoft are then pulling in the pc audience and the xbox audience together and then will immediately dwarf playstation yeah yep. interesting thing so there you go but yeah crossplay is certainly coming from uh, the newly acquired game by EA of course and uh, segueing from EA we slip into the next story which is EA Play Live uh, showcasing coming in July so funnily enough they're not going to be at E3 they're going to sidestep it by a few weeks uh, and show up with another EA Play Live event of course we covered it on the channel last year so we'll no doubt be overviewing it this year too so keep your eyes uh, on our channel for that content um but i wanted to kind of throw it out to you guys with what you really expect to see from ea because other than their annual annualized franchise we know battlefield 6 is no doubt this is where they're going to really showcase everything yeah. we need to know about that, that outside of fifa and stuff, to open, open the yeah, show. yeah. But yeah. what what else, guys? What are you expecting from EA this year, this uh, summer showcase? Ooh. Surely we get have... something like Codemasters in there, I reckon. Okay. If, like a formal announcement. I know they have formally announced it, but like on a big stage. Mm. Do you think we get our first look at Jedi Fallen Order 2? Ooh, that would be a good one. Open with Battlefield, close with Jedi Fallen Order 2. Perhaps. Because that's, that's I, good... I feel like... I feel Maybe like we might tease. be at the point. Yeah, just a tease yeah, at this yeah. point. Nothing more than that. Just a logo, perhaps. A, light, a lightsaber, light ignite, and then the logo comes. Maybe, from yeah, maybe, screen, maybe like a uh, cow voiceover or something yeah. or something like that. Yeah, that's what I'd like to see. Nothing, yeah. it doesn't have to be anything more than that. It just has to be confirmation. The game is coming. Here's the title art, like the, the logo mm. for the game, and just a voice. Ooh. What about Dragon Age? When's Dragon Age? meant to come out oh that's a good shout they did actually. tease it last year right they closed on a dragon age teaser with the guy approaching like the statue yeah. or something if i remember it feels about right to start giving us a, a date for that not hmm. like probably not a it's coming out in june 2022 but it's probably just like coming soon to come, hmm. coming 2022 that sort of thing hmm because uh because yeah but i mean bioware will be riding a wave of um positivity after the legend mass effect legendary just launched this past yep. weekend. Not coming to Stadia, evidently, guys. Uh, we thought there might have been a stealth drop. There wasn't. Yeah. But So, yeah, but Dragon Age, Battlefield 6. Uh, Jedi Fallen Order, I can't imagine that's that far off because they didn't do any DLC for it. So, Respawn must have been heavy working think... on the sequel immediately because it was so successful. Game of the Year award winning and such. Mm. Yeah. You've got to imagine they were straight working away and it's been, what, 2019 did it come out? I, I kind of wouldn't think Jedi Fallen Order and Dragon Age 4's release date is going to be somehow linked together. So if one's this year, the other won't be. Because um, I think they feel like they're yeah. big titles. Because it was 2018, the first time we heard about Dragon I, Age 4. I feel Jedi Fallen Order 2 will be... A, I, I'm, I'm, I'm expecting possibly a holiday 2022 release i don't think it'll be this year i think it'll be next year so we could be due something oh. for that with I'm dragon age potentially May 2022. <laughs> i think it's gonna be out this no, christmas really that's very I... soon that's only a two-year difference you've got to remember there. how quick I'm they actually thinking... announced the game and then put it out 
like the turnaround they they had it it was announced at that e3 with that really bad poor like presentation where it was like oh we've got a logo and that's all it showed you and then it was out the following year they've got the engine and let's face it ea 10 games around annually i mean it's true but at the same time jedi fallen order is now such a staple star wars like it's 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 just mm. it has to be done right it has to be done oh, right and yeah. i feel like a three i feel like a three-year cycle is good I, I'm i feel gonna, two it's rushing it i think I'm, I'm gonna go go with you chris and i think um jedi fallen order might be this year and dragon age next year um reason right. i'm thinking that is i think they're gonna give bioware as much time as they possibly can for dragon age 4 because i don't think dragon um bioware could survive another miss hmm all right. <laughs> I mean, arguably, uh, Mass, the Mass Effect um, remasters are going uh, hit. It's quite early to tell at the moment, but that's a remaster of a game that we knew were good mm. anyway. Yeah. yeah. But they haven't basically since there's. You can make a strong argument that since um, Mass Effect Three, they haven't had a good hit. True. Dragon Age Three, maybe, but it was a while ago now. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting um, stuff. We'll, uh, we'll find out. Obviously, we're going to have the next FIFA iteration announcement. Hopefully, come the Stadia day and date. We're going to have the Madden announcements. They've got Battlefield coming out at the end of this year. So, yeah. their cards are definitely, the deck's definitely stacked for a year. It just depends if they want that single player one to come out. And I could see something like November 29th this year. Star Wars. Yeah. When is Star Wars Celebration? It's in the summer, right? Because they do May yeah. the fourth, and they have like it's kind of around E three. It's kind of around E three because we don't know anything about the Star Wars it movies is. yet either for the year. Uh, all we've really got is Bad Batch. That's all. Like that's great, but it's out now. But we don't really know what the next big Star Wars thing is. So we digress. We digress. But yeah, EA Play Live, July twenty second, twenty twenty one. Check Star it out. Wars. We'll no doubt be covering. Star Wars it. celebration is August the eighteenth. So it entirely is. possible we'll get a tease for Jedi Ooh. Fallen Order at at this event and then more coming at Star Wars Celebration interesting stuff interesting stuff uh, right then gentlemen let's round out the news for the week with uh, some game updates and such uh, Assassin's Creed Valhalla Wrath of the Druids uh, DLC that was delayed it's finally out now takes place in Ireland and uh, there's some great reviews of that's getting really really positive feedback uh, there's one particular in um, review from thegamer.com which I found really interesting just because it was reviewed by someone who's um, Irish and their take on it and they're, they're really deep in the, the lore and the history of their country and their heritage and stuff. So it was really interesting to see from a cultural standpoint how they reflected on Wrath of the Druids and how it brings in their, their kind of like history to it all. And apparently it's fantastic. The the story, the arc, yeah, you got you get to go to Dublin as well and see that, how it looked back in the back in ye old days. And uh, yeah, overall, just really, really positive. And as someone who finished Valhalla a good while ago now and has the season pass, um, it's there for me. So I'm really keen to just get back into it once I've wrapped up on Watch Dogs Legion. Uh, I guess I want to throw it over to you, Tom, as someone who's still mm. hours and hours deep into Slugging Valhalla at this away. point. Yeah. Um, how, how, how are you feeling with this? Will you Are you one of those who jumps in early to the side content or do you like to finish the main thing and then I... pigeonhole yeah, that's... for later? It's a, it's a good shout, really, because I I usually, with things like this, I know I did with Odyssey, I didn't jump into the Fate of Atlantis stuff until after I'd finished the main story. Mm -hmm. So I think I'm probably going to do the same thing with this as well, get the main story out of the way and then dive into Wrath of the Druids. Like I've mentioned before, um, you know, I noticed quite some time ago that the outpost was already available in, in, um, in Ravensthorpe, mm -hmm. so it, it's already there, ready to go. Um, I just, I, I'm going to make a point of avoiding speaking to the guy first until... I am happy that I've wrapped as as much as I want up, really. I always see DLC as being, um, for me personally, I deal with it as a tag along after the main story. I never try to like interweave it into it. Mm -hmm. um, but some of the stuff that's dropped as part of the DLC prior to this, you know, like the Berserker updates and stuff like yeah. that, I've, they've just sort of already been there for me when I started the game. So I just took it as it was and just ran with it so if you're new to the game then sure by all means if you come across it go and do it but for me i'm just gonna wait to the end of the game at this point good stuff uh, a couple of points i'll pick out though tom to look forward mm. to you can summon an irish wolfhound you can help yes. you uh there are boar druids which are apparently a particular pain in the ass uh they've added <laughs> some new combat and level designs some new styles of fort to there so it adds a bit more to the the stealth approach if that's how if that's your play style and uh, yeah, a couple of landmarks, puzzles, story, but 
yeah, they, they do a really good job, Ubisoft, actually, of implementing the DLC with almost like a launch mission to tease you into thinking, look, if you enjoy this type of game or you're after more story content, do the trial mission. If you find it, here's the link to the season pass, buy it now. Um, but yeah, I'm, I've, I've kind of, I've had my break. I've been playing Watch Dogs Legion and uh, Valhalla's infinitely a better game. So I'm looking forward to, to diving back into it, hopefully before something new comes along. I do have Mass Effect, Richie. It came on Friday. So like you, I'm sat kind of thinking, right, I need to finish off Watch Dogs before I commit to a whole new entry yeah and uh yeah i'm guessing valhalla druids not for you you're not one for dlc you usually go jump back in after the fact no when i was finished valhalla i felt i was done with valhalla it was time to move on mm-hmm. um but for me when i spend over 100 hours in the game i rarely want more hmm. like i'm usually good at that point like i I'd say i want to move on so. Well, speaking of moving on, let's jump into the next story then. Uh, we've got a couple of announcements. We didn't get a blog this past Thursday. We got one on Friday as well. There now seems to be no consistency with what dates we get these new story drops. Uh, it's just kind of if and when the button goes live. Um, <laughs> Tom, this one's definitely for you. We are getting, as part of the community blog, uh, the community little boggling came back out, came back out of his hole. <laughs> there was some Strike more news. We need, we need, I need a graphic of like the, that little stadia boggling now. It needs to be like pit, stadia purple and orange maybe in like skin tone. <laughs> and his tongue, when his tongue comes out to grab you, it's got the stadia S right at the very end of it, <laughs> right at the screen. It's <laughs> just like that splash screen. Uh, that's That needs to be a thing, stadia boggling. Uh, so as part of the stadia boggling post, we got Shante and the Pirate's Curse is coming to yeah. stadia, of course. Uh, another entry in the Shante series, which uh, I know you're a huge fan of, Tom. Where does Pirate's Curse fit into the Shante cinematic universe of games, do we know? <laughs> Uh, so this would be the sequel to the to the remastered game that we that we got quite recently. So um, after Half Genie Hero, we get uh, Shantae the Pirate's Curse. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, another one I'm really looking forward to. I'd be very interested to see if this is actually going to be of the same sort of remastered style rather than the you know the old the older mm. graphics of it. Because what we've got to remember is that the Shantae series is quite dated at this point. Really, I mean they came back out in the early 2010s i would say maybe even mm-hmm. prior to that and some of them as as you've seen were even game boy advance games so that's how far back we're throwing it really um but yeah it's it's always good to get franchises like this on the platform again you know we've seen from the likes of the team behind steam uh, the steam world franchise as well they're going to be creating more games this year mm-hmm. which i'm hoping to see when we start to get an established franchise on a platform, it's always nice to see that the full cat the full catalog of games does arrive eventually because it's just it's nice to have that for people who are fans of the games just to be able to play through all of them really. Very true. So yeah, mm-hmm. um, in the description, embark on a swashbuckling adventure with Shanta, the hair whipping half genie. When she loses her magic, she must team up with her nemesis, the nefarious pirate Risky Boots, in order to save the sequin land from an evil curse. Uh, again, new features, new puzzles, etc., like that. And uh, yeah, that uh, they haven't given a date that says summer 2021, mm-hmm. which for Stadia with the first half of 2021, summer could range anywhere from March through to like <laughs> September, October at this point. Uh, but I can't imagine with these type of smaller games that it's usually a quite a quick turnaround from announcement to actual release. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. that's exciting stuff. And then in amongst the blog posts, we also got the Super Animal Crossing confirmation with i kind of guess a very good tidbit guys that uh it's coming free to stadia not stadia yep. pro just straight to free to play which if believe um, correct me if i'm wrong is this the first game to just straight out just be free uh yeah Des- destiny was of course uh, was pro and first. then yeah. yeah they've always transitioned to free they've not come out straight so, away as free, I don't think. and with crossplay this, this, this is gonna be a fortnite killer as well Oh, 100% straight away. I'm all over it. What a bold call. But, uh, yeah, interesting take. Uh, Modus Games, of course, big supporter of Stadia game from the indie front. Uh, We know it's a 64-player bit with, again, as I mentioned, cross-play support. So when this arrives on all platforms, the the player base is going to be there. And, yeah, I don't know whether this is Stadia testing the waters, maybe, with a different approach, doing it free. Uh, if it gets any kind of traction like Fortnite or PUBG got, it could be huge. And again, the fact that you can now play it anywhere adds another feel, element. But yeah, free. I feel it's a game that kind of needs to be free to play in order to get people in the doors. Otherwise, people might go even like even just like a ten pound price point. People might you got you people might go. Oh, is it 
Whether I don't mm-hmm. know, I might not. But if it's free to play, if you're interested in the game, you're gonna try it. Yeah. So, and if I'm guessing it's gonna have things like battle passes and stuff included, so they'll make mm-hmm. the money else. But like Fortnite's free to play, so the model works. True. It does True. indeed. If the quality is there, Richie. Yeah. And uh, final story of the week. Speaking of if the quality is there, um, we got an ESRB rating for Blaze and the Monster Machines Axel City Razors. It was covered by our friends over at Stadia Source. Um, this game, gentlemen, could not even find a trailer for it. Could not even find uh, a, a still image. It relate. I guess it's. I think it's a kids show. Again, don't have it children. Is. Tom yes. will point all child based point things towards you right now. <laughs> yeah. I like to know you nodded yes, 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 as though even though your unborn child has yet to choose their yep. television preferences, you're like, yep, it exists. I know this. I'm yep. a parent to be. How do you know? How do you know this is a thing, Tom? Need- I actually picked it up from comments in the Stadia blog post of people saying, oh, my kids absolutely love right. this. They'll, they'll absolutely, yeah, it's it's one of those things, isn't it, really? <laughs> like, it's it's a game like, um, what have we got? We've got the, the, the Dragons game that's coming as yeah. well, um, plus some others. Um, uh, they, they elude my brain right now. Brain no work. Um, <laughs> The boggling's got you. <laughs> yeah, we've got we've got lots of games that are coming that are very much sort of targeted towards a younger audience as well. You know, probably your your very early gamers, six to six to perhaps ten years mm-hmm. old, something like that. So yeah, yeah cool. don't have a cat racer on Stadia, so nope fills fills that niche gap. Yep. And uh, again, we joke, we but the reality is, is Stadia needs to appeal to a mass market, and there is a huge audience of children out there who don't get me wrong. I don't know about you, Tom, but you won't be buying your yeah, soon-to-be uh, newborn a console for probably quite some time. I'd imagine. Quite some time. I'd imagine when they come and say, "Dad, can <laughs> I have the new whatever it is?" That's a big decision to be made with the price of consoles yes. rising. So Stadia does give that uh, that foot in the door entry level of gaming because <laughs> um, you see kids all the time with phones now from a young young yep. age, and it's the cheapest point of entry, and Stadia alleviates that. So uh, yes. Don't think I'll be checking it out, if I'm honest. Um, but if no. you do fancy it, go uh, go check out uh, the uh, Blaze and the Monster Machines Axel City Races when it does drop on Stadia. That's all the new stories we have for everyone this week. The Boggling's back in his cage. And we are wrapping up for episode <laughs> 86, gentlemen. We've had crossplay, wow. we've had Ubisoft talk, we've had new games, and we've had terrible journalism brought up in the show. And not from us three from kotaku.com uh, but that's it that's all we have time for this week on episode 86 of the sounds of stadia podcast do remember to click like down below on the video subscribe to the channel and click that bell so you are kept in the loop with all things sounds of stadia like our many many live streams richie and tom getting drunk playing 100 days in their vineyard myself and richie jumping into the scary scary world of resident evil village which will be continuing later this week so do yeah. keep it locked to the channel so you don't miss out on all those jump scares and Ethan's poor hands being traumatised <laughs> beyond He's all belief. He's not much look with his hands, is he, really? Oh, like, no. Capcom have got George Lucas working for them. It's some, <laughs> something crazy, something crazy. And, uh, of course, we have our side quest episode that we'll be recording straight after this. Uh, Richie, what's our side quest mission for this week? We're going to be talking about whether Stadia is classified as current gen or next gen. Ooh, that, oh dear ooh. we're going to knock some heads there <laughs> we may yeah. quite do and remember you can get ap- that episode episode I suppose episode. it's available through an app maybe on your phone that episode episode available on Spotify Google Podcasts SoundCloud Pocket Casts all those podcast platforms in the digital cloud you can get that up to six days early on YouTube if you are a member of the channel so if you want to support myself and the other two lovely gentlemen to my side here that little bit more help us bring you better Stadia content do click join from below. You get loads of badges, loads of stickers, access to exclusive content that's available now, along with side quests like some of our first looks. I checked out SpongeBob last week, gentlemen. Believe it or not. Yes, I don't know did. what led me to that all of a sudden, but I thought I haven't played SpongeBob yet. I'm scared to death of Resident Evil, so I'm going to go for something a little bit lighter. What better than a yellow sponge and a starfish? <laughs> <laughs> Jumped into it. My first impressions look now available for members. Go check it out if you haven't done so already. Uh, but that's it. That's Stadia Stories of the Week. We'll see you next week for episode number 87. My name's been Chris. I've been Tom. I've been Richie. We've been Sounds of Stadia. Have a great week, everybody. Game on. Goodbye. <laughs>